I said he passed away in the middle of the night, and that's all I know. Also, saw this on uh, Facebook the other day. I don't remember who put it on there, but I thought it was pretty good, so I had to come and share it with you because we hear so much about the mask, you know, and having to wear them and people tired of them, and I like what this said. It says, I want to get on that road that Saul in the Bible was on. You know, the road to Damascus. <laughs> D mask us. Let it sink in. <laughs> okay, I thought that was pretty cute. I had to copy that one and bring it. Okay. I'm not even going to charge you for that extra little tidbit there tonight. Our text verse is verse 21 of Matthew. I'm not going to read reread the passage. We did that this morning, but I do want to highlight verse 21. And it says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. Father, add your blessing to your word tonight. May we exalt and glorify you, our blessed Savior. May we go home here tonight different than when we came in. May our lives be more consecrated unto you. May we love our Savior more than ever before. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We want to look at several things tonight. The theme is, Thou shalt call his name Jesus. And so we want to look at, basically, if time allows us, three things tonight. If we run out of time, then uh, one or two things. But we have three things on the docket we want to consider tonight about that name, Jesus. Number one, the title that was given to Jesus, the various titles given to him, his character and his work. And so I want us to just think about this as we are in this Christmas season. As we mentioned this morning, we sure would have loved to, uh, you know, have something brand new you've never heard before and something so outstanding that, uh, you know, a genius had to think it up. Well, since I'm doing the preaching, that part's not going to happen. But either way, we want to, to get to that old familiar story all over again, that name, Jesus. And it's important thing that it says he shall be called Thou shalt call his name Jesus. He goes by other names, other titles within the word of God, and every one of them are just as important in that name Jesus. Jesus means Savior or uh, the, the one who is going to save the world. But there are other names or titles given to us, I think, that are equally important that we need to be aware of. Number one in his titles is that he is called the Son of the living God. You remember in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said to the disciples, who do men say that I am? And they rattled off a whole bunch of names and, and of different individuals that different ones were saying who Jesus was. And of course, one of them was John the Baptist, who at that point was dead, and, and they thought he'd come back to life. And then he turns to the disciples and says, but who do you say that I am? And one of the greatest verses we have in the New Testament is found there in Matthew 16, 16, where Peter responds and says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And of course, from there, he goes on to say that uh, Jesus said, Upon this rock will I build my church. And uh, they always, different ones or different denominations have highlighted that it is Peter that the church is built upon. It is not Peter. It's on the confession of faith. It's talking about Jesus said, Upon this rock, the name Peter means rock. But the difference is the, the name Peter means little rock. And the word that Jesus used for rock means large rock. And so he's talking about the confession. It's a large rock that is built on, and that is that confession that Christ is the Son of the living God. John picks it up for us in John 6, 69, where he says, And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So when you stop to think about that, what a unique situation that we see here. God, divinity, the Son, flesh. God becoming flesh or God in human form. So when you think about that statement, you can't help but see that God loved us so much that he came down from glory for the purpose of going to the cross and redeeming us and making us a child of God. 
So his title, the living or the son of the living God. Uh, some want us to think that years back, for whatever reason, God died and God is dead. God is not dead. He is living. He's always been living, always will be living. And the evidence we have in that is his son who walked here in the flesh. The second title that is given to him is found in Revelation 1.8. In Revelation 1.8, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is, which was, which is to come, the Almighty, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning, the end. Nothing before him, nothing after him. Always was, as we saw this morning, always will be, uh, that he totally eclipses everything. Nothing is outside of his realm. He is the Alpha and the Omega. Now, the words Alpha and Omega are important words because uh, in the, the Greek alphabet, Alpha is would be, in our English, the A, and the Omega would be the Z. You find nothing in our alphabet before A. You can try. It's just not there. But when you get down to Z, uh, after you get past a few of those Z words, there's nothing. The dictionary comes to an end because there's nothing beyond Z. And Jesus is saying basically the same thing. I am the A and the Z in our terminology today. In the Greek, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the very beginning, the very end, nothing before, nothing after, and I encompass every bit of it. It's all involved in there. So he is the Son of the living God, he is the Alpha and the Omega. And thirdly, he is the blessed and only potentate. Uh, every time I read that word potentate, and by the way, it's found in 1 Timothy 6, 15, where he says, when in, in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. When I think of potentate, and I wasn't sure if my thinking was right on this, so I had to, uh, to go to the dictionary to, to define it, to get it right. But a potentate, I think of somebody, you know, very potent, powerful, someone that uh, uh, nothing greater than. And it was interesting because the dictionary says that word potentate means of great authority. You stop and think about this. Who has authority greater than God? None. No authority greater than him. Remember, Satan tried to rise up against God. And he says, I'm going to overthrow the throne of God, and I'm going to cast him out, and I'm going to become God. And what happened? God cast him out. And then we see demonstrated throughout the word of God that we have seen time and time again in the fact that when it came to the work of Satan, that he was subservient to Christ. He was not greater than Christ uh, in his demons, that are, the demons are the angels that fell with him. Revelation tells us that one-third of the host of heaven fell with him. And yet, whenever they were encountered with Christ, in, in our scripture reading yesterday, we read in that passage there in Luke, in, in the fact that uh, the demons cried out, that, well, are you here to torment us? And they realized they had no power greater than Christ. And, and in the one passage, uh, they pleaded that he would not just send them off into the abyss because uh, they got to occupy something. And they said, let us occupy something. And they said, there's a herd of swine, pig over here. Let us occupy them. And so Jesus allowed them to go and occupy the pigs. And the demons were, were so bad that the pigs went wild and ran down the hill and went into the water and they all drowned. And of course, the critics sat back and they, they criticized Christ because he destroyed these people's livelihood by destroying all their, their pigs and everything. Thing. But wait a minute, why did they have pigs? They're Jews. And the Jews aren't allowed to have pigs, pork, or anything like that. Not allowed to eat it, not allowed to raise it, have nothing to do with it. And they were in violation of the law of God to begin with. 
And so it was part of God's judgment. But you, what we see there is that, that these demons were subservient to Christ. He was more powerful or more potent than they were. And of course, you go back where we've been many, many times to, in a refresher course in the book of Job. And uh, he wanted to, uh, God challenged him and he wanted to, to put Job on the test. And God in chapter 1 told him what he could do. You could do this and this and this and nothing more. And he did that, and Job was still faithful to God. In chapter 2, then God said, you can touch him, you can afflict him, but you cannot take his life. He is not the holder of life or death. He cannot, Satan cannot give life. He cannot get, take life away. He has not that power. Only God does. So even with all the power, and we often give him too much power. He, yes, he is more powerful than us, but we attribute more power, almost deity, to him. Uh, we, we look at it from the standpoint sometimes is that, you know, we do something wrong, and how come you did that? Well, Satan made me do it. The question is, who do you think you are, that you are so great that Satan is going to spend what little time that he has with you? I know he's not going to spend any time with me, what, what do you think? Why do you think you're so great? He's going to spend time with you. He is not omniscient. God is omniscient, uh, or omnipresent, I should say. Not om he's omniscient, too, but he's omnipresent. God can be everywhere. How do I know that? I know that because he lives within my heart. But wait a minute, he lives within your heart. So how can he be all the way in the back of the room in Joe's heart and be all the way up here in my heart? Because he is omnipresent. He is everywhere. Satan is not that way. He can only be in one place at one time. Just like you. Just like me. You can't be in a multitude of places. You can only be in one place at one time. And you can't, you know, you might in your mind want to be over here or over here, but you're not. You're here. You know, many nights when, when I'm trying to sleep, my mind is taking me here and taking me there, and, and uh, last night uh, my mind had me here in the morning and this morning and going through my message and everything, and, uh, and I was just struggling with it all night long, and so I wanted to be here. I wanted to get up and come out and uh, finish putting it together. I did get up early and come out and finish putting it together, but it didn't do any good uh, because I still felt the same way. I struggled with it. And because uh, I can't be in two places. And uh, if I get up too early to come out, my wife gets upset because I'm leaving too early. So I have to wait. And some nights I sat there and sat there and sat there and sat there and, and wait until the time gets there, that of the clock, that said it's safe to get up without getting her upset with me. And so I get up and I come out. But in my mind, I'm here, but my body is stuck there. You know, and I can't be in two places, neither can you. You know, uh, we had a committee meeting, missionary committee meeting beforehand, and, and one of the first things that was discussed before we got into the meeting was uh, Christmas shopping. And do you have your Christmas shopping done? Are you ready for Christmas? I'm all ready for Christmas. All I have left to do is my shopping and my wrapping, and I'm, I'm all set. And I got some things bought, but I still got more to go. And uh, and, you know, if I could do that while I'm here preaching, I'd be up in Ann Arbor doing my shopping. But I can't do that. I'm not omnipresent. You know, you can only be in one place at one time. Satan is the same way. And we're told in Revelation 12.10 that he is before the Father night and day accusing the brethren. So if he's before the Father night and day, that's 24-7, accusing us, how can we turn around and say, well, Satan made me do it? He's not even here. He's up there. You know, he may have one of his uh, uh, fallen angels, demons, influencing us to do this or that, but he's not here. But we give him the credit for it, and we give him more credit than due. There's only one omnipotent, all-powerful, all authority, and that is Jesus Christ. That is a title that God has given unto his Son. Uh, fourthly, in 1 John 1, 29, it says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And so he is portray portrayed there as the Lamb of God. This is great. 
Because you go back again to Genesis chapter 3, and God made a way of salvation. And what was that way? The shedding of innocent blood, the slaying of the lamb, and then later it was built into the sacrifices of Israel to cover their sin, the shedding of the lamb. And it was all a picture of that which was yet to come, and that was the perfect Lamb of God coming once and for all to be that sacrifice for our sin. Paul reminds us in Hebrews over and over and over the fact that they did all these sacrifices in the Old Testament, and all it did was a temporary covering, a band-aid. I was reading uh, earlier uh, of uh, a fellow that uh, the article I was reading had to do with some great catastrophes that has happened. And this guy went out hiking and he was up into the mountains. He didn't tell anybody where he was going and what he was doing or where he was at. And he gets up there and all of a sudden this big rock breaks loose and hits him and knocks him down the hill and it comes down and lands on his arms and crushes his arm. And uh, he laid there for a couple of days, and he could not get that big rock off. And he's dying because he can't get up, he can't get away, and his body, is, he's hungry, he can't eat, he can't drink, because he has none of that within his realm. And he realized he's going to lay there and die. And so he takes then... He's able to get into his backpack and the, the, the little hammers and the, the hooks and everything he uses for scaling the mountains. He uses them and begins to chip away at his arm and, he, and then using some cutters he uses to cut the vines and so forth that he encounters as he goes up the mountain. He cuts the tendons and everything and he severs his arm off at the edge of the boulder. Before he does that, he takes a piece of cloth and he puts a tourniquet on. He gets out of there and he's still got hours journey down the mountain to where his truck is parked. But lo and behold, before he got there, a helicopter came by and found him. And they were able to, to save his life. And he, now he wears a prosthesis and he's uh, back climbing the mountains again. But you see... Uh, Back in the Old Testament, they had all kinds of sacrifices. This guy sacrificed his arm. But there was only one sacrifice that really counted. Back then, over and over and over. But there was only one that really counted. And that was the Lamb of God. He came once, and he only had to come once. And he died for our sin. That perfect Lamb of God. God chose his Son as that perfect Lamb, the sacrifice for our sin. The fifth title that we have is found in Psalm 118, verse 22. It says, The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. Peter picks up on that in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 6 to 8. He says, Wherefore also it is contained in the scriptures, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. He is the head corner stone. That's a title God has given him. The story is, uh, if it's accurate, uh, I wasn't back there. I came along shortly thereafter that point, according to Joe. But um, I wasn't there. But the story that is given concerning that, that passage in Psalm and, and that Peter refers to there in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, that it's referring to uh, the Great Pyramid. There, there some believe that uh, the pyramid is a temple uh, built in honor to God and believe that it was built back during the, the time of Job, which was pre-Abraham. Uh, they have never found any uh, evidence that it was ever used for a tomb like so many of the pyramids are. <clears throat> there are certain passages within that pyramid and each one of them has a biblical significance. Uh, the directions of the passages all point to certain key stars in the heaven. 
uh, I don't know, perhaps one of them is the Christmas star that uh, we're going to be able to see in, in another week. I don't know. I, I'm being facetious on that. But uh, each passage in there points in a specific direction toward heaven, toward everyday life, and toward hell. And they have found three compartments in there. There's one found way down low which a, uh, the way it is built and located, they believe it represents hell. There's one in the middle section, which uh, they believe represents the period of time we're living in here on earth. And then there, they have uh, found one up in the upper part of the pyramid, and they believe that is representative of heaven. And so the story goes that in the building of this pyramid, and by the way, right next door is the Sphinx, which is a picture of the, the, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And they believe that the two of them go together as, I, not idols, but uh, as places of worship before God way back then. Uh, I don't know. Uh, you would have to ask somebody a little bit older than me that might have been there that would know. But uh, that's what some of the, the books that I've read on this had to say. But when they began building this pyramid, there was this odd-shaped stone, and one of the unique things about the quarry back then, they would cut the stone and bring them, and when they got them there and put them in place, they were perfect fits. And many of them, they had to use, did not need to use any mortar or anything, because when they set, it was a complete seal the way they were designed. And there was one stone that was odd-shaped, and they couldn't figure out what it was and why it was there, so they just threw the stone away. There was a prefaces off over there, and they threw it over the prefaces. They get down to the end of the pyramid, and they're down to that last stone, which is called the cornerstone, the very peak, an odd-shaped stone. And they get a hold of the quarry and say, where is that final stone? We don't have it. They said, you have it. We sent it to you. And uh, they don't know where it is. And then one of the older workers remembered years before this odd-shaped stone that they threw away, they disallowed, just like Peter said, and it was disallowed and thrown away. They go over there in that preface, and they find it down there, and they bring it out, and they move it to the top of the pyramid, and it is a perfect fit. The stone they disallowed became the chief cornerstone, the most important stone in the entire building because it was that capstone. And we are told here in the scriptures that that headstone is a picture of Jesus Christ. He is that chief cornerstone. There is none greater than him, none more important and unique in every aspect of his life. Every aspect. One of a kind, if you please. And then the, the last one I want you to think about. I'm sorry, it's not the last one. There's a couple more yet. Another title that is given to Christ is that he is the great high priest. Hebrews 4.14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. He is referred as to as the great high priest. In the Old Testament, there was a difference between the priest and the high priest. The priest did daily, weekly, monthly uh, worship with the people and sacrificing for and uh, in the place of the people. The high priest, once a year, took that sacrifice and went into the Holy of Holies, the dwelling, the presence of God, and he made that sacrifice in there for us, for the sins of the people. And God accepted that as he took that blood from the slain goats that was in a little vial, and he took it in there in a little bowl and put his fingers in it and would sprinkle the Ark of the Covenant, which it became the mercy seat, and God accepted their, uh, that blood sacrifice for the sin of the people. One of the unique things about it, Josephus in his writings during that period of time says that the Jewish people did not believe in the fact that, that God would forgive them with just the, the shedding of blood of a goat. And, they, and anyone going into the Holy of Holies, apart from the direction of God, was instantly sh struck dead. If the sacrifice being offered was not acceptable, 
the high priest was struck dead. And if he was struck dead, they had no way to get him out. He had bells on the hem of his garment, and, and they were always in tune listening to that bell because as long as they could hear the bells, they knew he was moving around. But what happens if God didn't accept that sacrifice and he died in there? How are they going to get him out? So in their ingenuity, they tied a rope around him. Every year when he would go in, he had a rope tied around him. So if he died, if God did not accept the sacrifice and he died, they had a way to get him out of there without anybody else dying trying to get him out of there. And Josephus says that not one time is it ever recorded that God never accepted the sacrifice and the high priest died in there. What is that is telling us is that, that God forgives all of our sin. And as I, our high priest, he's at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. And as we saw a minute ago, Satan, our great accuser, is there accusing us before God day and night. And every accusation he makes, Jesus is right there taking up our defense and saying, wait a minute, my shed blood has covered him. It's all taken care of. And Satan doesn't have a case. As our high priest, he's always there interceding for us. And as such then Peter tells us that we are of that royal priesthood of God. As such, then we can come anytime, 24-7, into the presence of God as a priest and make our petitions and talk with him. And because of our high priest interceding and mediating on our behalf, and what he did at Calvary, he has opened that door for us to have that 24-7 access before a holy God. What a great uh, testimony that we have and great title he has. Number seven, we read in Hebrews 12, 2, that he's the author and the finisher of our faith. He says in Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, understand what he's saying, author and finisher of our faith. Understand the depth of that. The author, where does faith come from? Where does our salvation begin? It began before the foundation of the world when a holy God knew, because he's omniscient and knew what man was going to do, made that provision of salvation. And so he laid down that plan. He authored the way of salvation so you and I could become a child of God and know him in a personal, in a real way. But then it says he's not only the author, but he's the finisher. What does that mean? When he died there on Calvary and he said, it is finished, there was nothing more that a holy God needed to take care of our sins. He paid the entire price, every bit of it. Some denominations, uh, they, they are what we would call Judaizers. They're Judaizers because they are saying that your salvation is made up of faith plus works. You have to believe God for salvation, and you have to do this or this or this in order to be saved. Then if that is true, then that verse in Hebrews is false. He is not the author and finish of our faith. He's only the author, and it's up to us to finish it. But that's not so. He has finished it all. There is nothing that we have to do except by faith receive him as our savior and it's all done and you know the great thing about it one of these days that trumpet is going to sound there's going to be that shout and all who have put their faith and trust in him are going to go up he's not going to stop and examine each one well are you eligible you know, you, you read all these stories about peop, people going to heaven, and they stop at St. Peter's Gate, and, and he examines them as to whether they're fit. Like the one guy, he says, uh, you have to tell me one good thing you did. He said, I, I did one good thing. He says, what was that? He says, uh, while well, there was this woman, she had been accosted by these bikers. And so I stepped up, and I stopped them. And I protected her. And uh, they said, St. Peter said, well, that's great. Well, when, how long ago did that happen? He says, oh, about five minutes ago. 
think on it. It'll come to you after a while. You, you've heard it before anyways. But the, the fact of it is that, you know, all these stories about your salvation and faith in Christ is not enough. You got to do this and this and this and this. You got to be measured out here and all this kind of stuff. And you don't have to have any of that because he is the finisher. He finished it all. And because of that, then we come to Isaiah 9, 6 for the last title of him that we have. And that is in Isaiah 9, 6, it says, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace because he's the author and finisher, he is the Prince of Peace. When you trusted Christ as Savior, he took that burden away. No longer we have to worry about hell. No longer, we were reading the other night in, in our scripture reading, it talked about the fact that uh, all men's uh, sins are going to have to be given an account and it's going to be shouted from the rooftops and, and that everybody's going to know what's going on. And my wife says, I didn't know that. I said, you still don't because it's not going to happen. She said, I just read it. I said, it's not going to happen. She said, but it just said it's going to happen. I said, it is, but not for us. For the believers, all of our sins are covered and they're under the blood. And when we stand before him, it's a time of reward, being rewarded for what we've done for him. Those whose sins are going to be revealed and then they're going to be judged accordingly are the unsaved at the great white throne judgment and they'll be cast to the lake of fire. If you're a child of God, that verse means nothing to you. It doesn't apply to you. It applies to the unsaved. If you're unsaved and, and you don't want all that you've done to be shouted amongst about from the housetops and you don't want everybody to know, that's a good reason to get saved. I can give you many other reasons, but that's a good reason right there. Put it under the blood. Let the shed blood of Jesus Christ covers it and it's gone. You know, I'm so thankful for that. You know, back when I was a, a teenager and I was dating this gal, we never did anything really bad, just so you know. But uh, there were things that, especially as a professing believer, that shouldn't have been involved with. And uh, so we had this fellow, I worked in a grocery store, and we had this fellow come in. He was a sunshine cracker salesman. On his spare time, he held, did hypnosis programs at schools. And so, he want, we wanted him to demonstrate. So he took one of the fellows that works there and, and he told him that, uh, uh, put him under the hypnosis and he says, your foot is nailed, your right foot is nailed to the floor. You cannot go anywhere. You cannot pick that foot up. You cannot move it. And, and it was an independent store and when somebody had groceries to be carried out, the cashier had a buzzer up there and she and that told us the first person available, go. And so my manager uh, of the store turned to this guy. His name was John. He said, John, go do that carry out. So John turned and he couldn't go anywhere. And he, he pulling on his foot, doing everything he can. He can't move that foot. It is nailed to the floor because psychologically, this guy convinced him his foot was nailed to the floor. And no matter what he'd do, he could not to move it until the guy snapped his finger and brought him out of the trance and then he could move his foot like nothing was wrong. He tried to hypnotize me. These guys had been working and working, trying to find out everything they could about this relationship that I had. And uh, uh, like I said, there was nothing bad, but it wasn't all good either. You know, it's what you might call the gray areas. And, uh, but anyways, I was afraid these guys, you know, they put me under hypnosis and he would start asking me all these things and, and I would tell everything and that's all I would hear the, the rest of my days. And so uh, my mind would not allow him to hypnotize me. Did not know till later that you cannot go under hypnosis unless you are uh, willing to let your mind to be taken over by someone else. And I was not willing for that to happen. And finally, a try after try after try, he finally said, well, you know, there's two classes of people that can never be hypnotized. 
I said, really, yeah, who? He said, idiots and morons. I'm not sure which class he put me in. But the fact of it is that, you know, the Prince of Peace has given us complete peace, and we don't have to worry about any of that stuff being brought out because it's all under the blood. That's not the reason to get saved, but it's one of the benefits of salvation because it's gone. And what he says is going to happen is not going to happen for us. It's for the unsaved. And so real quickly again, the titles that we've seen, the Son of the Living God, the Alpha and the Omega, the Blessed and Only Potentate, the Lamb of God, the Headstone of the Corner, the Great High Priest, the Author and Finisher of our Faith, and the Prince of Peace. We're one-third of the way through, but our time is gone. We'll have to pick up the rest of it another time and look at uh, what we see there in his character and also his works. Father, I pray the Spirit of God would just challenge our hearts once again. We are so thankful for these great truths. Even though we didn't get into uh, these other aspects of his deity and who he is, Yet how great it is to know those titles and what they mean to us. And he's, he's not just the Son of God. He is Jesus, God's Son, and all these things that we have seen. And it's ours, blessings for us, given to us as a child of God. And we are so thankful for that. Again, challenge our hearts tonight, and may we learn to love you more than ever before. Don't let anything... Uh, dampen that love that you have for us. And even as we close out tonight, I pray that those that are gathered here, their hearts will have been greatly challenged from your word. But I also pray that those that are listening to the live stream would realize their need and come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, that they would bow their head right now and pray to that most blessed name, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know I cannot help myself and redeem myself, but I know that Jesus died for my sin, and by faith I receive you as my Lord and Savior. And I pray that one listening that has never trusted Christ would pray that right here and now. Now continue to bless as we close out the service this night. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want us to take our hymn books and turn to number 83, and we're going to close out singing that song. Brother Joel, let us stand. As... Number 83. <clears throat> There's something about that name. Let's stand together. <clears throat> Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus. Heavenly Father, once again, just what an honor and privilege to be here to worship this wonderful name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus. And Lord, I pray that it just doesn't end with the end of this service, but this is something that is continuous in us every moment of every day of our lives. And Lord, that uh, your name would be glorified and honored in each of the things that we say and do and uh, give us the opportunity to be witnesses for you to the uttermost parts of the world and even in our own realm or areas that you've put us into. And so Lord, I just pray that your hand would be upon us as we go out and be your witnesses. 
And Lord, just I pray if you will tarry long enough that we'll be able to gather again on Wednesday night for youth group and Wednesday night for prayer meeting and then on Sunday again next week to worship your wonderful and powerful name. And we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>